Well, hey, good morning. Good morning. I love that the sun comes out right as John was leading worship and music to God. That's just... Oh, thanks. Thanks. I appreciate it. Great to have you guys here. As Jeff was alluding to, we've got a big holiday coming up this week. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Every year, millions of Americans across America celebrate this holiday, this coming Thursday. And you know, there's certain elements to Thanksgiving that are pretty common to, to most of us as we go about getting ready for the holiday. You know, we, we drive long distances most often to go see family, to go see friends. We cook a lot and therefore eat a lot. Most of us watch football before we fall asleep, you know. We play games. We talk. And usually we, we tend to get a little bit more dressed up than we usually do. Um, not that I've ever been super conscious about fashion, but I at least make an effort on Thanksgiving Day. And I know a lot of you do as well. Each of us has typically that favorite sweater or that tie or, or that favorite dress that we like to put on for special holidays and Thanksgiving is certainly one of those. And you know, while most of us are, most of us are familiar with getting physically dressed, for Thanksgiving, what does it mean to get spiritually dressed? What does it mean to get spiritually dressed for Thanksgiving? Well, for that answer, we're going to turn to Colossians chapter 3 and focus our attention today on verses 12 through 17. Colossians 3, verses 12 through 17. And what we're going to see in our time here together is that getting dressed for Thanksgiving means putting on our best, donning peace and thankfulness, seasoning our words, and going beyond Thanksgiving Day. Now, coming into a book of the Bible cold like this, sometimes you kind of lose the context. Let me just kind of set this up for you a little bit. This, this letter was written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Colossae. It was most likely written in the 60s AD, possibly late 50s. And unlike many of his letters to the various churches, Paul actually didn't found this church uh, we, it seems to be from Colossians 1.7, it's actually by his friend Epaphras. But as a leader of the church at large, Paul writes to this, these Christians in Colossae to encourage them and to admonish them and to correct some, some false teachings that were going on there. And within this epistle, we see thanksgiving and gratitude throughout and especially here now in, in chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. Let's just read those together now. Paul writes, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Getting dressed for Thanksgiving. And the first truth that we're going to see in this passage of Scripture that we're going to look at today is that getting dressed for Thanksgiving means putting on our best. And we see that specifically in verses 12 through 14. Let's just review those verses real quickly. In verse 12, we're told to clothe ourselves as God's people, chosen, holy, loved. As God's people, clothe yourselves. And clothe yourselves with the very best. Clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. And then in verse 13, we see to bear with and, and to forgive. 
In verse 18, this is where the compassion, the kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, this is where they're put into practice by bearing with one another, forgiving each other, not forgetting the sins of which God has forgiven us. As a matter of fact, Jesus speaks to this in Matthew 6. He says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive other their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And then in verse 14, we see that it's tied all together in love. What holds compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience together? What is it that brings these into one collective body? It's the love of Christ. It's the love of Jesus Christ, which binds them all together in perfect harmony. Perfect harmony. You know, when you, when you come across a verse like verse 12, it's easy to just bop, 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 bop. You kind of just miss them. Miss the significance of these words. Compassion. What does compassion look like? Well, as far as Christ is concerned, compassion is throughout his ministry. And if you want great examples of that, we see it especially in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, I'll make these available tomorrow in the Monday notes, but specific places where we see Christ's compassion pouring out is in Matthew 9, Matthew 14, Matthew 15, Matthew 20. Over and over, time and time again, Christ has compassion for the people he's ministering to. Furthermore, Christ gives us a beautiful picture of what compassion looks like. And he gives us that picture in the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. I won't read you the whole parable, but right there in verse 20. But while he was still a long way off, the prodigal son, okay, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son threw his arms around him and kissed him. That's what compassion looks like. Kindness. We know what kindness is. We're just not always kind. But we know what kindness is, don't we? You don't need me to explain that. And in Galatians 5, we know exactly where kindness comes from. It actually comes from the Holy Spirit of God living inside the life of the believer. Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Humility. Now, people in America, at least, we have all kinds of ideas and definitions and heavy air quotes, truths as to what humility is. But I'm really not too concerned about those. And, and frankly, I don't think you should be either. What does God say humility is? That's what we should be more concerned about. I think a good place to start with understanding what Christian humility looks like would be in Romans 12, 3. Paul writes, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Meekness. That's another word that we think we know and don't necessarily know. In the Greek there, meekness is pros, to be meek. And, and what it means is, is gentleness or meekness. It's the opposite of self-assertiveness. It's the opposite of self-interest. It stems from a trust in God's goodness and control over every situation. Controlled restraint. Do not confuse meekness with weakness. It's trust in God. Jesus says in Matthew 11, he says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am, in the NIV it says gentle, but it's the same Greek word. I am meek, I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus also says in Matthew 5, he says what? He says, Blessed, blessed are the meek. And when we truly understand what that word means, we understand why it is truly a blessing. For they will inherit the earth. Finally, patience. It's like kindness, right? We know what it is. We just don't always like to do it. But you know, just like we know what kindness is, just like we know where it comes from, it's the same with patience. That too, if you, if you missed it, that too is a fruit of the Holy Spirit of God. Don't pass through these words too quickly. 
I realize this particular passage of scripture is one that if you've been paying attention throughout the year, it's one that I've referenced multiple times, but God has just put that on my heart for right here and right now for this year. Patience. Proverbs 19.11 says, A person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. We all have different families, but I guarantee each of us have people who give offense in our families. Bear with. Bear with. Some of you know, not all of you know, but some of you know that Thanksgiving is actually my wife's favorite holiday of the year. It is absolutely her favorite holiday. She loves, she loves everything about Thanksgiving. She loves the food, the weather, the football. The football might be mine, actually. But she, she watches when she can, okay? She loves everything about it. She just loves it. The time with family. And for Kim, she especially loves the food. We love to cook. Kim especially loves to cook. And she loves this holiday so much that she actually prepares a week in advance. Today is day one, by the way. All right, we're, we're, we're prepping today. We... No, I'm just watching Sai, okay? She prepares. And she actually has a calendar laid out. On Monday, we're going to prepare this dish. On Tuesday, we're going to prep this side, and so on, right up to Thanksgiving Day. And let me tell you, come Thursday morning, that kitchen, it kind of has the air of like a, like a wartime command post. It really does. I am not the general, okay? I'm the same rank in there as I was in the Army. Low, all right? I'm just the help. Just the help. No, she she preps and she works hard because she wants that day to go well. She wants to be a good time. Now I'm glad Kim prepares a week in advance for Thanksgiving because it, it renders some very delicious results. But you know, something I, I love to see us as God's people do is not just prepare food, but prepare our hearts for Thanksgiving to prepare our hearts for thanksgiving. If you're wondering how to apply these verses, I would start with this. Don't go into your Thanksgiving holiday just hoping for the best. You'd certainly never prep a big meal that way. Let's not prep our hearts that way either. Don't go in just hoping for the best. Prepare. Prepare your heart and prepare your mind. Lay out your clothes and put them on. Put on compassion and kindness. Start like Kim. Start, start today, already preparing for that day. I realize Thanksgiving, it's a great time for some. It is an incredibly stressful time for others. Bring a lot of personalities into one room. So start preparing now with putting on your best. Humility, meekness, patience. Start preparing now. It's going to be easier come the big day to bear with and to forgive, to bear with that really annoying brother or sister, cousin, aunt, uncle, in-law, outlaw, whatever. If we start dressing right, right now, if we start preparing, it comes a lot easier. And if you're wondering, Trev, this is a tall order. You know what? It is. Where on earth do I find the strength for that? Well, you don't find it on earth. You find it by remembering the love that Christ has shown you and the love that Christ has shown me. And you let that love fill you to love others. Second truth that we see about getting dressed for Thanksgiving, that is getting dressed for Thanksgiving means donning peace and thankfulness. And we see that in verse 15. Peace and thankfulness. The people of God have been called to peace. Let me say that one more time. The people of God have been called to to peace. Let God complete the work of peace in you. Because it's through peace that we are able to act as one body and be thankful. God's peace is for God's people, for those who love, fear, and follow him. Psalm 37, consider the blameless, observe the upright. A future awaits those who seek peace. Psalm 85, I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants, but let them not turn to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him. 
that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Donning the attire of peace and thankfulness is a spiritual act of sanctification performed by God in concurrence with our obedience. First Thessalonians 5, Paul writes, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And skipping down to 23, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. You know, according to a recent Gallup poll, Americans rank number three in the world as the most stressed out and anxious people. On the face of the whole earth, we rank number three. We tied with some other country. I can't remember right now. You can go back and email me, all right? Yeah, as a matter of fact, the only countries that outranked Americans in being stressed out were Greece, the Philippines, and Tanzania. Sorry, we were number fourth. Greece, Philippines, Tanzania, and us. This means, think about this now, okay? This means that Americans are more anxious, we're more worried, we're more stressed out than people living in a place like Nigeria, which is the home to places like Boko Haram, okay? Acts of terrorism, intercommunal clashes, violent attacks. We're more stressed out than places like Lebanon, a nation racked with economic collapse right now. We're more stressed out than, than places like Ukraine that lives under constant threat of invasion of one of the world's greatest superpowers. Now, I'm not saying we Americans don't have legitimate stresses, okay? We do, we do. But when we compare that to some of the other stress existing out in the world, you gotta wonder about that. You got to wonder about that. Why are we so much more worried? Why are we so much more afraid and anxious than all these other nations that are living under considerably far more stressful situations? Well, I don't claim to give you the whole answer, but biblically speaking, based on the word of God, I would argue and I would put to you that we are more anxious, we are more worried, we are more concerned because we have just laid aside the peace that Christ offers. Thanks, but no thanks. And in laying aside the peace that Christ offers us, we can't be thankful for anything. We really can't. You know, it might seem strange to consider peace and thankfulness as spiritual disciplines, but they are. Now, don't misunderstand me, okay? The peace that you have is not of you, but it is in you. If you've put your faith and you've put your trust in Jesus Christ, you have the option for peace. You have the option to be peaceful and thankful. But those things are ours to make use of. It's not something typically that happens overnight. It's actually, like most disciplines, it's something that has to be practiced. So where to begin? Well, I would say that a good place to begin would actually be in our thought life. I think Paul would agree with me in Philippians 4. Philippians 4, and specifically verses 4 through 8. In my opinion, it's one of the most overlooked passages of Scripture that, that we have in the Bible. We just skip right by it. But specifically Philippians 4 8, Paul writes, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, what? Think about such things. Think about such things. Let's be, let, let's consider what we actually spend a lot of our time watching, reading, listening to. There is a lot of media out there that does little more than foster anxiety, anger, depression, and, and just ungratitude. 
Now, I'm not saying we need to cloister off, okay? That's not what I'm saying. I am saying we should consider where we spend the bulk of our time thinking, listening, reading, watching. And instead, focus, focus on things that are noble, <laughs> true, right, pure, lovely, admirable, praiseworthy. I think if we spend more time thinking and considering these things of God, the spirit of peace and thankfulness will likely come a lot more easily. Third truth that we see about getting dressed for Thanksgiving is that getting dressed for Thanksgiving means seasoning our words. We see that in verse 16. In verse 16, we see the message of Christ received in worship. Not just to know the word of God, but to let the word of God abide in us richly, richly. It's by that word that we teach and correct one another. Don't miss this now in wisdom. And it's with thankfulness for the good news of Jesus that we respond in worship, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God the Father. Our mouths are powerful instruments for good or for bad. James 3 says, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. This should not be. Jesus addresses this in Matthew 15. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. That is what defiles them. And that's why Paul, just a few verses later from our main text here today, says, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer everyone. You know, it takes the cooperation of 72 different muscles to produce a word. And on the average day, we produce about 16,000 words, 16,000 words a day. And for the average lifespan, that's about 860.3 million words in the average American lifetime. 860. And when we understand, we just heard from God's word how powerful our mouth is. When we hear how many words we put out, what does that say about the condition of our heart? What do, our, do, our, do our words condemn us? Do they defile us? I can't answer that for you. That's a conversation between you and God. But it's something to think about. Being a Christian doesn't mean checking your brain at the door. As a matter of fact, being a Christian means the complete opposite. It means fully engaging your brain and being wise. If you read through the book of Proverbs, which is a book dedicated to God's wisdom for us. If you read through the book of Proverbs, about every other chapter, there's a proverb about God's people being careful of what they say. As you and I prepare for Thanksgiving, let's, let's consider what's going to come out of our mouths. Just as a helpful hint, some good questions to ask before we speak is, one, is what we are about to say true? Is it true? And then the second question to follow up with, is it helpful? Is it helpful? Don't miss that key verse in 16 there. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with what? With all wisdom. You can pull God's truth out of context and make it say something that God is not saying. Is what you're about to say true? Is it helpful? Does it need to even be said? Let's season our words. Let's season our words with God's word. And when in doubt, fill our mouths with praise to God in gratitude for everything he has done for us and still has yet to do. 
Fourth and final truth we see here today is that getting dressed for Thanksgiving means going beyond Thanksgiving Day. Verse 17 is a familiar verse, I'm sure, to many of us. But again, don't go through it too quickly. Whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever you do, do it in the name of Jesus Christ. As we seek sanctification in every aspect of our lives, we also give thanks to God the Father through our one and only mediator, Jesus Christ. Thanksgiving for the people of God is not really a one-day thing. Thanksgiving is an everyday occurrence marked by the permeation of Christ in every aspect of our lives. That's why Paul writes in Romans 12, he says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to what? To offer our bodies as what? A living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And what is it? This, this, this is your true and proper worship. Everything we do at home, at church, at work, at the grocery store, wherever. It says Christ's ambassadors. And as a matter of fact, that's what we're called in 2 Corinthians 5.20. And it's also as representatives of God's people, the church. That's why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3, you yourselves, writing the church in Corinth, you yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. The 1970s saw an influx of imitation dairy products being put into and onto all kinds of food products. And so to combat these counterfeit foods, the California dairy industry, they developed the real seal in 1976. And this very quickly caught on. And so in 1980, the United States Dairy Industry Association, they, they took ownership of the program and made it nationwide. I'm sure you've seen it many times on many products that you've bought. But what does that mean? The real symbol, it's a seal of authenticity which guarantees that the product you're buying is actually made of real milk that's come from actual real cows. It's not some imitation. Now, you and I, we can be imitation Christians for a Sunday. We might even be able to pull off being imitation Christians for a family meal. But real, authentic, born-again disciples of Jesus Christ follow him every day in every way. That is our heart's desire. That is our heart's ambition. Putting on compassion, humility, kindness, meekness, patience, forgiving and bearing with each other, dining peace and thankfulness, seasoning our speech with the word of God. These are all very good, godly things to bring to the Thanksgiving table. But the truth is, these are spiritual clothes, and these are spiritual words for every day, not just the holidays. If you're already living a new life in Christ, please listen to, to what I'm about to read. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. What does this mean for us? It means that even Thanksgiving dinner can be used to glorify and praise God. So let's get dressed. Let's get dressed for dinner. Let's put on our best. Prepare even now. Start preparing your heart and your mind with compassion and kindness, humility, meekness, patience. Don the spirit of peace and thankfulness. Start with your thought life. Let's marshal the content that comes in. Focus instead on those things of God that are pure and noble, right, true, praiseworthy, excellent. 
Let's season our words with the word of God in wisdom. Is it true? Is it helpful? Now, Proverbs 10, 19 says, when words are many, transgression is not lacking, but the prudent are restrained in speech. So let's season our words with the word of God and, and fill our mouths with praise. And let's take these spiritual clothes and these spiritual words. And you know what? We can wear them more than on Thanksgiving Day. We can wear them every day. Now, if you're not yet living a new life in Christ, if you come this year and you sit down to Thanksgiving dinner and your family starts throwing words around like punches in a barroom brawl, or if you struggle to find anything to be thankful for because you are just so anxious, if you come to Thanksgiving and you just don't have the strength to handle that family member, or if you come to Thanksgiving and it just seems empty and meaningless, bring Jesus into Thanksgiving. Bring Jesus into Thanksgiving. And now if you're thinking, Trev, you know, that sounds kind of hallmarky. What does that even mean? Well, it means turning away from the life that you're living, the way you've been doing life. Your life's not working out because you're the one running it and you're running it into the ground. It means, it means admitting that you're a sinner and repenting of that sin. It means also receiving the forgiveness of that sin by trusting in the life and the death and the resurrection of our one and only Savior, Jesus Christ. And it means recognizing that in this new life, should you choose to receive it, it means following him, letting him call the shots. I love you guys. Hope you have a good Thanksgiving. Let's close with a hymn.